Sarah, are you there? Hey, what's up? <laughs> are. So tell us about what NASA has been doing. I know that we're coming up here on a big holiday weekend for the United States, the 4th of July. You know, as we all know, this last couple of years, there's been a lot going on in this country that a lot of people can't unify on. And I'm not going to go into detail because we can't get political here. We're all city workers. But something we can get unified on is some of the great stuff that NASA has done for us. And, you know, not all of it has been done just by us either. A lot of it has to do with international cooperation, working with other astronomers, working with other agencies. So, um, you know, what? tell us a little bit about it. I'm not going to put you on the spot here and tell us all because that's impossible. But give us a little flavor about what NASA has been doing, if you will. All right. So the things that we can go rah, rah, yay USA for. I've kind of captured a little bit of that here. And I hope you can agree. So NASA, JPL specifically, is the for up until just this year they were the only organization to successfully land a functional anything on the surface of mars and that happened in 1970 with the, the vikings <laughs> viking one and 75. 75 75 76 yep i'll get there eventually the numbers are there i just have to sort them out <laughs> so since 1975 nasa has had all this data from the surface of Mars and various other places at their disposal. But because of the way NASA was founded, and I'll talk about that in a moment, that data is not just for us. It's not for us. It is for the world. And so rah, rah, yay, we landed on Mars and everybody benefits. But it's not just the surface of Mars. We're not just daring mighty things. Let me laser pointer it up. Oh, will it work? Umbrella in the top corner. That's the parachute for perseverance. And if you know Morse code, you can decipher the red and white spacing. And that says dare mighty things and the latitude and longitude of JPL. And yes, NASA dares mighty things and frequently achieves them and shares that with the world, which is pretty amazing. And it's not just Mars, the deep space network and all other deep space craft uh, send back the information that we're gathering from. We've got on their New Horizons, we have uh, the Pioneers, we have Galileo, well, they weren't cut off, oh my goodness. Uh, we have <laughs> the Mariners, we have Juno, which Patrick talked about earlier, we have Cassini, which just ended its mission a couple years ago, and of course, the granddaddy of them all, the Voyagers. And all of these craft communicate, I mean, that's just a tiny handful, a smattering, if you will, of all of the craft that are out there communicating back with us, and not just us as in US, but us as in the world, through the Deep Space Network, which is one of my favorite pieces of equipment, and it gets too little praise, I think, so I'm just, I always throw it in whenever I can, and then NASA isn't just looking outward at the stars. NASA is also looking back at Earth. And Earth-looking satellites are tremendously important. And because of NASA scientists and Earth-looking satellites, we have an ozone layer that is no longer degrading. It is now regrowing. And we had uh, Dr. Michelle Thaller, one of NASA's uh, lead communicators on our show a couple of years ago, if you were with us for that, it was a pretty amazing talk. And she gets asked all the time, like, what is the point of NASA? And she said, how about grandchildren? Here's why. And because the Montreal Protocol signed in 1987 that banned CFCs that were destroying the ozone layer, that happened because NASA scientists using NASA data gathered with NASA satellites they sounded the alarm. They said CFCs are destroying the ozone layer. The ozone layer is what's protecting us from UV radiation. And at the current rate, we're destroying the ozone layer. The amount of UV hitting the surface of the earth will make land, will make all agriculture impossible. The land will become unarable because the plants won't survive by the year 2042. <laughs> World governors, world governments and leaders responded and we are recovering. The ozone layer is rebuilding because lucky for us, CFCs, 
they uh, they take off out of the atmosphere and they break down and we're better off for it. We do need that ozone. And even though it's a poison down here, we love it up there. <laughs> and thank you, NASA. But we're not done because, well, we look even farther. NASA had a series of great observatories and we've talked about Hubble and it's one of the last remaining of the great observatories, but they have acquired so much data. These, the beauty of space captured by Hubble, it hasn't been just a scientific tool, it has been an inspiration tool. And that is something that science seriously lacks. Getting people involved in STEM is so potentially difficult <laughs> because so much of science is numbers. And if you don't speak the language of math, it can be daunting, but Hubble images, everywhere we look, it makes science approachable. And that is just incalculable, the, the positive effect of just those four great observatories. Oh my gosh, I'm getting choked up because I love it. All right, so moving on to, you know, this one, it's just that one day in, you know, 1969, whatever, it's fine. But Number. It, right? Because <laughs> what a phenomenal moment in human history. This is not just America's victory. It's one of the few times in all of human history where there was a victory without a loser, right? I, I'm sorry, Soviet Union. I don't, like, you benefited too. And I know that everybody ha is on board with it now. Whether, you know, it was spurred on by the Cold War, but no one was, you know, I don't have deep CIA knowledge, so I'm sure people were hurt during the Cold War, but not in the process of getting humans to space. There were no gunshots fired. There was no warfare happening. This is a just a victory without a loser. And that's such a wonderful moment for all of us. And going forward, sure, we planted the American flag because, you know, a flag, but that's okay because, well, it's, it's just a white piece of plastic now anyway. What matters is that we went and we're going back. And eventually, because of collaboration, we will go back as a planet. We're not gonna go back as countries. I mean, eventually, for, for a little short time, there will be some countries fighting over mineral rights, but eventually that's not gonna be the case because space is hard and we work better together. And this is, all me being really pompous and just like, yay, NASA, but yes, yay, NASA. I am going to argue that NASA is the U.S.'s best invention ever. And I know I'm going on. I'm so sorry, but it's NASA. All right. So the reason that everybody gets access to all of this is in NASA's charter. When NASA was created, it was created for the betterment of all mankind. Everything NASA does almost everything, if it's not classified, is for everybody. Our data, our science is for the world. So not only did we do some cool stuff, but there are residuals. NASA has given us not just those cool moments, they've also given us things that we use every day and maybe don't realize. However, some of those things are not Tang, the Fisher Space Pen, Teflon, or Velcro. These are things that NASA gets credited with but they're not the case. NASA did not invent these. They were all invented by other companies. However, the Fisher Space Pen was invented for NASA, but not through NASA funding. Okay, what did NASA do? NASA did the computer mouse. NASA did Nike Air. So the process that allows the, the rubber in the soles of those sneakers to trap air and use air as a cushion was created by NASA to get padding firmly, snugly tucked into helmets to protect astronauts' brains as they're being jostled and experiencing G-forces. They gave us Nike Air sneakers. And Tempur-Pedic, the, the memory foam mattresses, that is a NASA-developed cushion. Um, CMOS digital camera sensors, that was developed for flybys of planets, and they are used in almost every single cell phone because CMOS sensors use a fraction of the amount of energy that the other kind of sensor uses. So almost all of our camera phones are NASA technology. 
Also, NASA doesn't take credit for the miniaturization of tech, but all of the companies vying for the contracts, and since space requires smaller, lighter, and better, all of the companies vying for those contracts, they were pushing themselves on behalf of NASA. So the reason we have the microchips and the microprocessors in these incredibly powerful, tiny, tiny packages is because they wanted to get to space. And we thank them for it. So now we can have, a, an we can have the equivalent of a supercomputer in our pocket because five megs of RAM used to take up the size of a room. All right, so, and there's even more. I'm not done yet. Surprising ones for me were not the, the gear that firefighters use, but the jaws of life. The tech that, you, that they use to snap the scissors shut is the same tech that they used to sever the bolts on the space shuttle during launch. <laughs> right. This, the, the same little pyro charges. Similarly, uh, the landmine deactivation. When NASA has leftover solid rocket fuel that doesn't get burned, it's, you know, they didn't get it put into one of the SRBs, one of the solid rocket boosters. They put them in, they take a small amount of this. It can't be, you know, formed into a, an SRB anymore. What are they going to do with it? It's basically asphalt that burns. You point it in a landmine, you neutralize the trigger mechanism in the landmine and it it's neutralized it's done you can just remove it safely black and decker dust buster they needed a way to clear particles if you're in a spacecraft you need to get particles out of the air you need a dust buster <laughs> baby formula that has enrichments algae thank you nasa gross i'm just kidding unfortunately Ice, the astronaut ice cream never it was developed with technology for nasa it was it has never gone to space all right but if you would like to know more about nasa spinoffs if you would like to deep dive because it goes on and on and on nasa spinoff is a magazine that they publish you can look and see all of the things that nasa has given us that we use in our everyday lives and don't even realize it and you can use nasa patents this is not just, <laughs> hey, these are the things that these big companies, no, you can apply to use a NASA patent. And in the understatement of the year, NASA says benefits to you. It says, uh, you know, this uh, data management. No, that's NASA being humble. That's NASA being very clearly scientific. When you click on these links, it takes you to the way NASA data handling data management and data processing is being used to oh fight cancer identify cancers identify patient groups identify all sorts of everything the medical industry is absolutely benefiting from nasa data analysis okay i'm gonna leave it there please dig further nasa spin-offs just go on forever thank you <laughs> We absolutely could, um, but I think it covered a lot of them there, which is terrific for us. A couple of points I wanted to make along the way, although no shots were fired at astronaut, astronauts at each other during the space race, Russian cosmonauts did carry a firearm with them into space, but it was not to be used in space. It was when they landed, got out if there was a bear. At least that's what I had heard. So, they land um, in Siberia, so they, yeah. have, they still do carry firearms. Yeah, I so. love it. That's that Very is, interesting that point. That is the second but, most Russian thing I've ever heard. Exactly. <laughs> but thank you for the, the fascinating tale of NASA and everything that we're doing and how that's going.